Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerbie, and today I am so excited to have with me Kat Cole. First time on the show. Welcome to the show, Kat. Thanks for having me. I've been really looking forward to this conversation because we interview a lot of people, mostly investors, who are looking at companies more or less from the outside inward, right? And you are, you've been in the inside and operating multi-billion dollar brands and companies. And I wanted to take the opportunity to kind of peek under the hood a little bit, what that means exactly. Because as investors, we look for great leadership. And here you are, a proven great leader of multiple companies. And there's just so much to learn from that. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Before we get into all that, I think it's kind of important to touch on how you got to where you are a little bit. The fun fact that stood out to me is that you became a VP at Hooters by age 26. So how on earth did that happen? And a few things converged. You know, one uh, very important foundational element is that the company was growing rapidly. And that fact creates more opportunity. And you can't remove that from the equation and get the same outcome. Uh, beyond the company growing rapidly and therefore resulting in many opportunities for people inside the company, I, I started early. I literally started working in the company when I was 17. So while 26 sounds early, and uh, it was, it was still, you know, essentially a, a good number of years into my tenure there. And so I was a hostess at 17, a waitress at 18. By 19, I was opening franchises around the world uh, as a training coordinator, literally traveling, showing up, training the staff, leading the training team, getting the franchise launched, getting the first ever unit in that country, in many cases on that continent, open to you know, begin the brand's journey there. And, and so that put me in a position to understand the business from the ground up. I took a corporate gig at the age of 20. I was the first person in my family to get into college, but I was subsequently failing college because I was traveling so much in my first and second year. So I dropped out at the age of 20. And then from that point, as a 20-year-old, helping to lead a department in the corporate office, uh, which is what got me to Atlanta, Georgia, again, as the company grew, I grew. And every few years, I took on more responsibility. And then just six years after starting my corporate journey, uh, I became an executive with the company. Well, something just stood out to me there because you, you said you've worked multiple roles. I even heard or read that you at one point as a waitress would jump in and work the cooking line, you know, mm -hmm. if, if needed. So where did that drive come from? I mean, that's a fairly uncommon trait that you don't see very often. I, you know, I don't know that it would be fair to call it drive back then. Uh, it was, I can look back and see the patterns of doing many things like jumping in the kitchen and, and really assess what was going on. It was in part curiosity, just like, can I do it? <laughs> um, it was also a genuine desire to be helpful. I'm a helper. I always have been. If people need help. I raise my hand. I go help. But all the cooks quit one day. That's how I ended up in the kitchen cooking. One day the bartender needed to go home to take care of a sick kid. So I ended up working a bartender shift. The manager needed help shutting down the restaurant. So you know, the answer was just always yes. And so there was this deep curiosity to see, can I figure it out? There was a true desire to be helpful. And then the third driver was um, whatever you want to call it, selfishness, um, you know, personal reliance. I was paying my own bills. We were very, very poor when I uh, became of working age and needed to save up for my life's expenses. And so more shifts meant more money. And, and different types of shifts being added to the, the menu of options of shifts also meant more opportunity. So I also can't remove that from the equation of what looks like ambition or drive, but was simply like, oh, great, more opportunities to you know, make money. So curiosity, helpfulness, and then this you know, concept of either selfishness or self-reliance. So as I understand it, your father at one point was a more of in a white collar role mm -hmm. and you had a comfortable upbringing to a point and then it changed. Right. And so you went from that to living on very little. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, it, 
do you see that as playing into this in any way where where sometimes you've you've kind of seen the potential a little bit, right? And and were you trying to get back to that sort of level of comfortability oh, at that, no. such a young age or nothing like that? Okay. No, just- no, no, no. In fact, it was the opposite. Because my, we left my dad when I was nine, and yes, we had a comfortable living compared to everyone else on all sides of the family. Um, my association with that was a very negative one. Um, we had holiday gifts and we had a car and we had a house that wasn't on wheels and we had like not good things going on in the home. And so in my mind, the one person with the fancy job on either side of the family equaled bad stuff. And so it was the opposite. I wanted nothing to do with money. As soon as I made it, I gave it away. In fact, it became a a real missed opportunity because I didn't save and have the thinking around financial planning um, that would have benefited me even more, you know, because I actually started making a lot of money very young uh, because I was such a young executive and I just wanted to give it all away. I didn't want anything to do with it. I had a very unhealthy relationship uh, with money. The good news is it led to an abundance mindset. You know, if I need it, it will come. Uh, and, and even if I don't need it, if I'm doing things I love, it will come. And it did. Uh, but at the same time, it was something that I felt was deeply tied to negative outcomes and behaviors. And it would take me time to figure out the healthy balance in between those things. What did tie to the drive was this desire to be independent and not be reliant on people like my father or other elements of my family. I just wanted to learn. Doing something different tomorrow meant I was going somewhere, right? Different even for the sake of different was progress in my mind and learning became my currency. That's so interesting. Yeah, I'm just fascinated by this idea of nature versus nurture, right? Where people as driven as you who achieve so much, especially so young, where that comes from, if it's environmental or or just comes from within. And I love the idea that money is more or less a byproduct, right? And you mentioned being a helper. And I imagine that just putting all that good karma or driving the ship with that kind of good karma led to that abundance you kind of speak about. Very, really interesting. You mentioned um, dropping out of college at one point because you were so busy, which I can relate to. And um, I was curious because when I've heard you speak, you come across as just, I mean, one of the most intelligent speakers and uh, that I've heard, and I, and I wonder if you were, if you have a practice of writing, and I'm also kind of curious if you were a good student, you know, I'm fascinated, fascinated by kind of the book smarts versus the street smarts, and you kind of seem to have both, so I'm fascinated by that. Yeah, I was a very good student, um, you know, it, advanced AP, all, all of those things. Uh, I excelled in every subject in school, until my senior year. And I just got lazy. It wasn't challenging. I wanted to be a rebel. I was hanging out with people who were far my senior and I barely eked out my senior year (laughs) with with decent grades. I mean, it wasn't horrible, but not compared to my straight A's 4.2, 4.3 of literally everything leading up to that. Um, Made my mom a little nervous, but everything worked out all right. Um, So I, I was a great student generally and had a natural inclination um, toward academics. And and so there is some, you know, core book smart there. And I was put in situations all around the world with a complete lack of familiarity of culture with people I had never met before. And that forces, at least in anyone who wants to be successful, it forces a muscle of Um, excellent communication, not only articulation, because I'm in other countries and yes, they speak English, but needing to speak clear English, not, you know, what I would call comfortable or lazy English was critical, you know, in order to be understood. And so very quickly between the ages of 19 and 20, I completely lost my accent. Um, That was very deep from growing up in Jacksonville, Florida, which is basically South Georgia. Um, where often people will hear me and say, I literally cannot tell where you're from. And it, it, it wasn't a goal of mine. It, it happened because I wanted to be understood more easily. 
And I needed to articulate very clearly in order for that to happen. So that occurred organically on the, you know, on the other side of speaking or words or intellect words have definitely been my jam for a long time. I have pictures of me speaking in front of groups when I was three years old. So it would be one of those, how it started, how it's going memes for sure. Um, and I've been a large scale public speaker for a very long time. So when you have to say a lot, in a little amount of space to people you don't know, that also builds a muscle of communication. But I do believe the thing that formed my ability to communicate in a way that is clear and approachable, um, but still intellectual, is running businesses from a young age and needing to be in various stakeholder groups, from lawyers to attorneys, um, to the press and media, hourly employees, executive employees, you know, this really pushes on, uh, on the need to get through, to get a message across, not to just be good at saying what you want to say, but understanding that the real goal is to be heard and felt uh, and valued. And that, again, it's like this water weathering rock to, to build a really strong foundation for communication. And speaking more on, commun on uh, the education piece, I know you went back and got an executive MBA, mm -hmm. which I found interesting because you were kind of doing, right? Where instead of mm -hmm. you were learning on the job actually by doing it, did you find much benefit in going back and getting that executive B MBA? And what were you looking for that you weren't getting in the real world? It was, I mean, it was a great program for me. Granted, this was, I was, it was a few years before I left Hooters. So I had been a seasoned executive by that point, and I graduated uh, one month after I started as president of Cinnabon. And so to your point, I already had the job, you know, I wasn't, and then I got another one with, without it running something even larger and being the dude, you know, the dudette at the head of the company. Um, it was more, there were a few things that drove that decision and, and I'm really glad I did it, although I, I don't know how I would think about it now, given the evolution of alternatives. Um, one, one of my mentors, who was a longtime recruiter in the industry, called me again, different time, right? It's 2008-ish. She said, look, you're well known in the industry. You know, I, I led some of the industry's largest nonprofits and industry associations and organizations and as a result, was very well networked through various companies, not only restaurant and franchise businesses, but anyone in the value chain, supply chain companies, marketing agencies. And so she called and said, look, if you want to stay in this industry, you'll have no problem getting whatever role you want over time. But if you want to expand beyond the industry, you're not even going to get through the HR filter of some of these companies for a board of director role or for a C-suite role if you don't have an advanced degree. And, and it was interesting because again, I, I had an amazing gig and I had a path to many others, but the idea of doors being closed to me for such a silly reason was ridiculous. <laughs> you know, I was like, why would I not want my optimal optionality? And so, so that was really the why, the driver to at least consider it. But then I said to her, but I dropped out of college. I don't have an undergraduate degree. And don't you need a bachelor's to get a master's? And she said, well, I know of one person in the industry who uh, went through an executive MBA program and was able to test out essentially through both their experience and of course, GMAT, GRE. I mean, you still have to lower the risk of the university's program. And he was able to to get his master's through that program. And that's all I needed to hear, right? One person has done it. And I said, oh, perfect. I can definitely do it. And so I applied to Emory and Georgia State and Georgia Tech and University of Georgia, all the major you know, tier one universities that had master's programs with Atlanta campuses. And I got into all of them, got past all of their filters. But the one that really stuck with me was Georgia State because of their how diverse their university is in every sense of the word, including their global affiliations. And I'd been running international businesses since I was 19. And so being a part of a, a cohort that was truly international, I think 80% of the class had a passport other than the United States. That was incredibly attractive to me. So I chose Georgia State. 
Uh, I had to take the GMAT and pass with a higher score than the typical admission score. I got many CEOs to write letters of endorsement to further evidence that I was a bet worth making. And I got in and finished. And, and I would say, and it was an amazing experience, but I would say it wasn't just the content. You know, now the content is a bit easier to access. Um, it was the cohort. It was the professors, people who had run businesses, the relationships, the um, the interaction and the thought exercises, the global travel that we did as part of our capstone, spending time in Turkey and in China uh, and in other parts of Pacific Asia with these folks with whom I was sort of, you know, expanding my mind and sharing my perspective. That was the value of the program that I would say was absolutely worth it today. And I used my savings to pay for it. I didn't take out a loan. Um, there were no grants. I just Bye bye fiat, <laughs> you know, and it was gone, and uh, and and it was worth it many times over. Not just for that network, but the you know resulting confidence because I did wonder. Well, I've been in Hooters at that point. It was for thirteen years, thirteen out of the fifteen. Am I just good at this because I know this company inside and out, or am I actually objectively a phenomenal business leader? And could I replicate and even improve on the success in a different? industry or company. And so that was a question in my mind that I believed going through business school might help me answer. And it did. That kind of touches on my next question, which is more about integrating systems in an organization mm -hmm. and where you learned that, where you built your framework to do that. You know, you did go on, especially to Cinnabon right after and, and I mean, 10 X probably your success or more that you had at Hooters. I'm curious, what did you apply at Cinnabon maybe that you learned up to that point? What was iterated on? And do you believe that there's sort of a one size fits all for every company or, or, or do different companies need different customized approaches? Well, we probably need an entire podcast to <laughs> thoughtfully answer that question. So I'll just touch on, you know, a few things that come to mind. Um, but the answer is, is much deeper than we're going to have time for. So one is it relates to what translated from you know, chicken wings to cinnamon rolls, from casual dining with alcohol, corporately owned and franchised to almost solely franchised snacks, malls, airports. Um, a lot translated, all of it translated. It, it may have evolved or tweaked a bit, but the fundamental approach of being obsessed with the customer, obsessed with the key stakeholders, in this case, franchisees, and employees and the closest, most enabling vendors, like obsessed with them, in love with them, really wanting to understand what's going on in their life right now and how our business affects that. That is a, a major key, you know, if you will, to apply anywhere, always, and forever. And and it just the the, the questions are the same, the answers are different. And then the resulting actions are, are you know, targeted to that particular environment. So that's one thing that translated. The other thing that translated is, you know, out of my 15-year tenure at Hooters, only two years was spent in the orange shorts, like actually serving wings and serving beer. I, I was doing other things as that second year occurred, like opening franchises and helping to train other employees and going to other restaurants. But I was still a waitress in between those things. I was still an hourly employee with no contract in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and that experience of being a waitress, a server in a casual dining environment where my income was tips. This is a tipped wage state, right? So the base tipped wage was $2.13 an hour. And so all your income is tips, which means the customer's experience is so literally tied to my financial success. And when you have the privilege to be in a situation where you have such proximity between your effort, the customer's experience, and the returning appropriated value, that is a very tight feedback loop. It is instant. Like if they don't like it, I can see it. <laughs> you know, I'm not wondering what was the unboxing like, you know, I'm like right there. And so that is a powerful training ground for a customer centric mindset, clear on how value is created and shared. You know, I can be a great waitress, but if the cooks aren't competent, 
the outcome, you know, so you can just see how this, you're, you're just literally the entire value chain is right in front of you. And you're at the beginning, the middle and the end of it, including receiving the food and preparing the food and, you know, it's just um, such a powerful training ground. And even though that was only a small piece of my overall Hooters tenure, it has never left the way I think about the world, uh, customers, employees, brands, and how deeply I appreciate the connectedness uh, of all the things in the business. So I could go on and on, but those are two things that um, certainly translated. And, and then in terms of frameworks, I am, I am the queen of frameworks, um, partly because I was asked a lot of questions like this from a very young age. How did you do that? Why did you do that? And it made me think and it made me reflect. And then when I became a public speaker, I was forced to put things in you know, a nice package that was easy to remember uh, and to apply for oneself in their own environment. And, and so the frameworks, because I was in so many different environments, became necessary because I couldn't remember or translate every individual varied situation, but I could see the patterns between them and use that as something that would make each endeavor or team or challenge or brand um, to make that learning curve a bit faster and to help others again ask their own questions that I had learned to ask, but then come up with answers that were relevant to their situation. And so I developed a, a lot of um, what would be considered frameworks that I largely use to populate my newsletter today. So, okay, that, that's a good point because I was wondering, are these written somewhere? Are they <laughs> documented? Will they be in a book someday? Yeah, yeah. I've got a book coming out with Simon and Schuster uh, next year. Fantastic. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that you've since moved on into this role of more of an advisor and investor. So I'm curious, do you examine the systems in the companies that you're interested in investing in? Do you audit them in any way? Do you let entrepreneurs develop their own? How do you kind of think about your active role in your investing? You know, it's a big giant asterisk. It depends, you know, if it's pre-revenue and an idea and I'm investing in the founder, then of course I'm not evaluating framework. There are no frameworks, right? It's, it's more, can I use the frameworks that I have applied and the resulting set of outcomes as a frame of reference through which to see the opportunity? And so the frameworks are more about my experience and my filter and how do I connect with the founder, the market opportunity, and then how those two things are converging to create whatever this business is. So that it's very different at early stage pre-revenue or just post-revenue seed stage than it is something much later. And even then as an investor, because I'm not an institutional fund leading around, you know, I am typically a contributing angel, a follow-on investor, or a strategic advisor being brought in. I'm being brought in to help them learn these frameworks. And so I don't expect, nor do I judge, if someone early in the journey doesn't have these things in place. For the founders and funds and companies that I'm a, a heavily involved advisor, these frameworks are a lot of what we talk about and spend time discussing how they can put their own version of it in place if it's what's needed where they are in their journey. Do you have like a, a rudimentary framework that you would kind of start with? I know it's, 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 it's objective, but is there something kind of fundamental that you think every leader of a company should enact? And it's kind of a basic principle for you. Yeah. Um, ask, answer, act quickly in proximity often. That's it. Every one of my frameworks fits into that framework. It is a question looking for answers, the goal of ensuring that there is an environment in which the answers flow freely and candidly, uh, or that you are able to give the answer freely and candidly, and then action on what you learn. Rinse, wash, repeat. Every one of my frameworks is a series of questions and then the answers guide the actions and the actions are what make the difference in progress. Kind of sticking on this leadership role, what you just say kind of reminded me, is this sort of also a framework for culture itself of a company? And how would you 
turn around something you would consider to be a bad culture at a company or what, where would you start? Um, I mean, the framework, since it is so foundational, um, is for everything. So the answer is yes, for yeah. culture, um, a bad culture, you know, first you've got to do your best to diagnose the roots of the weeds and not just chop off the top of the weed. And so what are the roots of the weeds, the culture weeds, the things that are making it not a productive culture? Because culture is just what happens when the leaders aren't in the room, right? It's how people kind of self-manage the organization. It's what people say we do here or we don't do here. Um, it's what's permitted. It's what's promoted and recognized. I mean, that is all culture. Um, but those are just the behaviors that show the culture. The question is why is it the way that it is? And what are the one or two largest things either again, permitting the negative things to be there or actually promoting and creating it? Because sometimes cultural elements that are negative are self-inflicted wounds and the company is not some victim, you know, to some like culture monster that came in and sprinkled these negative seeds that became weeds. It's often a series of either individuals um, that have been permitted and even often promoted that behave in a way that sets a tone for negative culture and or systems that don't allow the things that would create a positive culture to, to thrive. Um, so again, ask, answer, act. You ask a series of questions to understand what's going on in the business, to do your best without judgment, um, to get a sense of really where the roots are and make sure there is a culture where people feel safe to answer candidly. And if it's a bad culture, that's probably not the case. And so you have to work really hard to get at the true truth that is then actionable, look for patterns and then act on, you know, the most commonly cited patterns. And then once you take care of those, then you go to the next view and the next view and the next view, um, I have a series of frameworks and tools that I have written about and used in many companies um, that were born out of old school restaurant opening tactics, one called the MMDD log, which is asking everybody to answer what made my day difficult. And I've got a whole newsletter on just that. And then there's check-ins, monthly check-ins that are not about KPIs um, or OKRs, but are about reflecting on the month and what's gone on mutually. I ask you, you ask me, we answer together. It can be as short as 10 minutes, as long as 30 minutes, but that is a practice and a behavior that not only builds positive culture, helps root out negative elements of culture. And then the hotshot rule, which I'm known for and talk about often, which is the regular act for me, it's weekly of envisioning someone I admire in my role, asking what is one thing they would do differently if they took over my role tomorrow. And the answer becomes apparent uh, very quickly, and then acting on it within 24 hours. And then the last step of the hotshot rule is telling my team every week. And so you're just constantly doing this. And that gets at a lot of things that go beyond culture, but certainly the idea of staying close to the action, which in business is the transaction, is what helps a leader um, know kind of where to point and push to both allocate resources and lean in, but can also help to transform a culture more quickly. So as I understand it, you were placed as president at Cinnabon right during, you know, or right after the financial crisis, essentially the great recession that incurred or ensued thereafter. It seemed like a, an amazing value investment, you know, for the firm, or at least who who made that acquisition. I I, I don't know if the acquisition happened during the recession, but it seemed way before. Oh, way before. Okay, mm -hmm. but you, this turnaround was incredible. It kind of reminds me of when you know Buffett invested in in American Express because there had been a controversy of sorts. People had lost faith, but the brand was so strong that he knew it would recover. Mm -hmm. And Cinnabon seems to follow a similar narrative there. And mm -hmm. the brand was incredibly strong. I'm curious when you took, you know, the reins there, did you see it as, uh, what, what were some of the biggest challenges on day one? I, I imagine there was a lot of ancillary just because of the environment, the economic environment. Were there cultural challenges as well? Were there any other things that stood out to you that you had to address on day one? Yeah, none of them that I could address on day one, I'll tell you that. Um, um, day one, you're 
you know, looking right. for the back room and trying to meet people. Um, but one in, in terms of the economics stability of the business, they'd had multiple years of high single digit, low double digit top line sales declines because of not only the recession, but in particular being primarily based in malls and airports during the recession. And when people don't have money, there are two things they stop doing, shopping and traveling. And so you, know, you just like lost the humans. And this had nothing to do with e-commerce yet, right? It was just like people had no money. And so they were saving it and not doing these things and the businesses in those venues were hurting. Um, then on top of it, there was this just overall shift it, with the few people who were coming in in consumer preferences, even for indulgent businesses. And we were a premium price dessert, which is not the best place to be during a recession. Uh, and it's at, at the, the time, the business model was a highly infrequent visit, you know, like 1.4 times per year. And so if you miss people that 1.4 times per year, they don't, you know, you don't have another chance. And so there weren't alternative channels of revenue outside of the base business. There weren't alternative for the franchisees. There weren't alternative channels that we would eventually lean into like grocery and other like massive markets that have a far higher frequency rate um, and much more opportunity around the world. And so just the the brand was beloved, but the business model was flawed uh, or and it had become broken over time relative to the evolving environment. The other element of the business model that was challenged at the time is, you know, we're, we sell food. That's part of what we sell, but we also sell franchises. And in order for franchises to expand, you need lenders. Well, I'll tell you who a lender was least likely in 2010 to loan money to a first time business owner for a concept based in the mall at the heart of the recession, serving a cinnamon roll the size of your face, famous for sugar and fat at the height of the Atkins craze, which we joked was the Atkins crisis for Cinnabon. And so, you know, now there's like this lending crisis broadly that definitely was, was particularly detrimental uh, and exacerbated for a potential Cinnabon franchisee. So both growth levers, growing units, and growing sales out of the units were depressed. And so you had that sitch, <laughs> you know, it was very interesting. Um, and then on the, on the culture side, you had you have very tenured franchisees and incredibly tenured employees who love the brand, but they were tired. They had been beaten up, you know, losing whatever you want to call negative sales. It's not winning, right? Losing that many years in a row is hard. It's hard on your heart. It's hard on your pride especially because in the years prior, you are used to, like, all I do is win. You know, it was like the biggest brand with the highest volumes. Everybody loved it. And so, you know, that's a big crash from an ego perspective, not to mention franchising as a business model. These are small business owners that have their life savings, most of them, in these businesses. And so it's particularly emotional. I also had uh, the largest franchisee who owned a third of the units was essentially insolvent um, because he was running a borderline Ponzi scheme out of the restaurants, it was so crazy. Um, and had to deal with that and then our reputation with the malls and developers as a result. So you just had all this mess, like legal stuff, franchise stuff, optics, emotions, culture, and then the business model needed to be fixed. And we needed to go into channels that we you know, really had only begun to explore. And so that was the diagnosis. What, I, what I'm hearing is that uh, because you then ventured on to, to different channels. You must have seen this optionality of the brand that, that wasn't apparent to the people before you. And that's what's so interesting. I'm wondering if it's where that comes from or, or what, how, what led you to think outside the box. And I, I'm remembering right now you mentioning that Hooters at one point, you know, had an airline. You know, yeah. they were definitely doing what I would, what Jim Collins would call sort of the bullets and cannonball sort of approach where they're firing bullets seeing where it's seeing what sticks and then going bigger into this. So I guess without answering the question for you, <laughs> what, how, I'm just curious, was there, was there something that, that you applied in this scenario that was like, okay, we got to think outside the box here and, and optional optionalize this brand a little bit more. It was just so obvious. Um, maybe that was the gift of fresh eyes. To your point, I had grown up in an omni-channel brand before omni-channel was cool. We had a hotel, we had an airline, we had a casino, we had our own merchandising company. We were fully vertically integrated. Like, I, you know, I grew up with a brand that was 
far beyond the places it belonged. Just because it was in places doesn't mean it was successful or the right place. But my belief of where a brand could go was certainly in part shaped by my experience at Hooters. And I was just a young consumer. You have to remember, I'm 31 when I'm taking over Cinnabon. I'm a consumer. I'm a fan. I am of the modern era. I'm on Twitter and none of my president peers of brands were even on there, right? And like, there, it's just a different mindset when you're technologically native, representing literally a different generation and came out of a brand that was expressed in so many creative ways. And to the credit of the company and the leaders who came before me, they had begun the, the journey of alternative channels. They had a little bit in grocery. They're, they had begun, it was just no one put on the gas and in order to put on the gas, you had to step back and really deconstruct the brand, figure out where it had permission to go. And then in order to go there, what do you need? And are you going to rent that capability, build it or buy it? And so there were little sprouts of the opportunity already in the company. I didn't start licensing an omni-channel at zero. They, were, they had played, right? And, and there was there were one or two lines of business that were clearly material and had tons of opportunity like Pillsbury. And, but it was so linear and it wasn't a model being applied across that brand, much less the other brands, which I would later go help do. Um, and, and so that was the magic was both who I was as a young consumer, what I believed was possible for the brand. And then it's, all about execution. Just because I had these ideas and saw the potential and so did some others in the company, clearly it hadn't been done to that extent before. And execution was part of the challenge in a franchise business, getting franchisees to appreciate the opportunity for the brand and how it actually served them as opposed to competing with them. And that was the art part. Like I brought the art and heart that is needed to build a branded ecosystem across channels because doing it just on the science and compliance um, is doesn't work, not when you have that many stakeholders. And so it wasn't just the vision to see what was possible. It was the ability to test, learn, bring it to life, build trust, resource the organization appropriately, and have the humility to decide when it was time to not build the capability, but partner with someone else that already had it. I've been speaking with a few investors and, and they brought up this potential of optionality as more important than I ever would have thought, especially when you're making an investment, just knowing how much of an advantage it is to have a lot of optionality. Um, Amazon comes to, you know, comes to mind people, other brands that have ventured into other spaces. And what, what has got me thinking about a lot lately is mission statements and how important they are. So for example, Tesla's is to advance the adoption of sustainable energy, right? It's not to make the best car, it's to advance the adoption of sustainable energy, which means that it does make sense for Tesla to now do solar panel roofs and to do big batteries, et cetera. Is there a mission statement or was there a mission statement for a brand like Cinnabon that you said, okay, this can be applied in these markets or through this lens? Yes, but I will say most companies that are well-known today that have mission statements that seem so inspirational and obvious, that was not their mission statement when they started, right? It was like, I don't know the case for Tesla, but I'm sure some car companies, it started as like, make a better car, you know, get people to where they need to go in a classier way. And, and then as they mature as a company and realize what they're doing is more than their product, that's typically when the mission statement like levels up <laughs> a couple notches and becomes this umbrella under which many things can sit. And so I just, for anyone earlier on the journey, like don't beat yourself up if your mission statement doesn't give you the permission to become Amazon. Um, and yeah, Cinnabon had a, a tagline that was a statement of inspiration that helped guide where we could go. And it was life needs frosting. And it was about giving people an indulgent moment wherever they are, because life is hard. And, and then that had to be then interpreted. Well, what does that mean in cereal? What does that mean in coffee? 
What does that mean in a fresh bakery? What does that mean in visual creative? What does that mean for how we talk to our franchisees, right? This brand voice, brand truth, brand um, approach. And so it's more than a mission statement. You know, the mission statement typically is the why we exist, what we're here to do at a kind of a platform level, because you do want to give yourself permission to extend. But most product companies don't have that stated really beautifully in the early days. It's once you realize what you're actually doing with the very linear thing you started with. And you're like, oh, you know, wow, we're bringing people moments of joy. And, and so, but the mission statement is important in that it helps ground in the why we're here. That, and, and it will evolve over time. It is not the key to the brand and the business being successful, but it is a helpful piece of content that allows for a more consistent understanding of what is behind the approach to the business and what it, you know, what it's trying to do in the world. I love life needs frosting. That's an incredible <laughs> tagline. And it, and it, it really does highlight how powerful a brand is and what it what it brings up in your mind and and the question that came to my mind uh is what are you really selling right you, yeah you're selling uh, cinnamon rolls the size of your face as you put it but what are you really selling and you're really selling that sparking of joy as you mentioned that moment for people mm-hmm. and you realize that is that would you consider that at least part of the secret sauce that makes up what you know these billion dollar brands that you've now managed. I mean, how does McAllister's Deli, you know, what, what, how does that compare to something like that in the portfolio? And are are there similarities? You know, there are similarities in that what you're hoping for and what is likely you have built at least at some point, if you are a scaled brand, because otherwise you wouldn't have been successful is some emotional connection because most things in their product form are replicable. And you could argue are commoditized. And so then what is a brand? And it's a lot of things. It's how you do what you do. It's why you do what you do. It's what you say. It's how well you deliver on those statements and promises. It's the consistency over time. It's every touch point that the customer has Uh, which at the beginning is a single product and some marketing messages, but over time has more to do with their interaction with mistakes and humans and all of that at scale. And so, you know, what was true at Cinnabon is we were so that life needs frosting was also then the, well, what does that mean? We deliver, we deliver irresistible indulgence and that needs to be true relative to whatever channel we go in. So is the coffee with green mountain Keurig, the Cinnabon license partnership as indulgent as a classic cinnamon roll baked fresh in a bakery. No way. Like you can't even put them on the same sweetness scale, but relative to their category, that Cinnabon coffee was irresistible indulgence. Like the work that went into the flavor profile and the aroma to make your eyes roll back in your head to be like, Oh yes. The perfect note of like yeast and butter and cinnamon and dough that is coming through in a light roast coffee that is gluten-free and fat-free, you know, is different, but it's the same things are true relative to that category. For McAllister's, um, for anyone who doesn't know, it's literally like a cash machine and one of the most successful franchises in all of food franchising. And it has very large and sophisticated franchisees. And it came out of Jackson, Mississippi, and they sell sandwiches and salads and are known for huge baked potatoes and delicious soups. It's like Americana, at its finest. It is not the sexiest, trendiest, you know, juice, dessert, whatever brand. It's it wins because of its model of hospitality. Like they're famous for their sweet tea and you get free refills and the portion sizes are enormous. The value proposition in terms of value for money is like high top decile of all restaurant brands. And this um Southern inspired hospitality that transcends no matter where it is, is part of what makes that brand special. It's community connections. So big groups go eat there. Families after, you know, a soccer game, a whole church group will go and have a lunch there. Um, 
it, you know, it skews families and it skews older, but it's also very close to college campuses. So college kids love the value proposition. And so that is about home favorites that you remember, but better. It's like, you know, baked potatoes and sweet tea and club sandwiches, but, but better. No offense to moms, you know, our moms that have made them, but it's like plussing up a classic. And so super different from Life Needs Frosting, right? It's like community connections, home favorites done better, but consistently at scale over time. And which is a credit to the franchisees, a credit to the original recipes and brand. And then you have like Carvel ice cream, you know, almost a 90 year old brand. That's a very different value proposition. Jamba Juice, which is one of the largest smoothie and bowl chains in the world, very different value proposition, right? And, and mission statement. Now there are similarities because you're affecting communities, you're serving food, you're doing it in generally an accessible price point. You know, these aren't aspirational Uber premium brands, nor are they value fast food brands. They kind of live in this middle tier. Um, so there are similarities, but there are distinctions, which is what's allowed these brands to become most of them billion dollar brands. That, that's an interesting point. Actually, I was curious about that because you're, you called it out that the brands in the focus portfolio are not aspirational, nor are they bottom tier. So it, what is the framework for focus brands? What is the mission statement, I guess, for that company, the holding company? Like what, what framework are they using to say, okay, this fits into the portfolio because it meets X, Y, and Z? You know, it's pretty easy for people to find. I mean, I left Focus in January and was there for 10 years and was president and COO my last four that I was there. And so the reality is Focus Brands is a machine of strategic capabilities that acquires established brands, brings them into the portfolio, injects them with these advanced capabilities, honors whatever makes them special and true and pure and defensible in the marketplace, and helps them scale using those capabilities in a way that they could never afford on their own as a freestanding business. And then you have all this cross-pollination of learning and leadership and talent and even franchisees. And now as the brands become more well-known as part of the portfolio, even to customers, right, to cross-market, um, it is this machine of a portfolio that was very early. I mean, the only other material multi-brand franchise prior to Focus was Yum Brands and Taco Bell and KFC and Pizza Hut. And, and it was different because those brands, each of them individually were bigger than focus brands, right? They're like massive, massive companies, but they were under the Yum Brands portfolio. Focus Brands was similar, except with these like fighter tier, you know, scaling. When we buy them, they're usually well before their billion dollar a year sales mark. And then we take them there. Um, and so they need these strategic capabilities. They don't have the, you know, the, the balance sheet individually to go get the best technology, and the best talent, but wow, can we help those franchisees punch above their weight? Because as a group, we can go buy the best. We can leverage supply chain and expenses together. We can lower cost of goods. We can share best practices. Again, in a way, if they were on an island on their own, they would be missing out on. Something came up a minute ago. You mentioned community and how that impacts brand. And that's a word that I'm hearing a lot lately. Community, 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 this Web3 development, et cetera. And what I'm harking back to in my mind lately is when I was a kid, there were all kinds of like, you know, let's call it communities or whatever. You see something on a cereal box and you cut it out and you mail it in and yeah, you, you become part of this sort of membership of sorts. Like there's a loyalty element to it. So these, these ideas are not necessarily new, right? As far as like creating exclusivity around uh, community, et cetera. Why do you think there's such a movement happening right now around this idea of community and, and getting brands to be so interactive uh, with their customers, especially digitally? So many reasons. And, and you're absolutely right. What we're seeing with Web3, you know, the evolution of, to the ownership economy where people are not just participants, but creators, owners, shapers of companies and brands and economies through DAOs and 
crypto and NFTs and then just the overall mindset, it is an advancement of old forms of loyalty, rewards, ownership, and community. And whether it's old school, like points and rewards programs that are being brought into a modern era with far more transparency and traceability, uh, or the idea of a digital good, which is not new. People have been buying, you know, coins and things in games for de literally decades. We've been like, buying things that allow us to play in a universe. Now it's just the universe is our life and it's the metaverse. And, and the why is one, the technology has advanced to such a degree that uh, it is unlocking the opportunity for the individual to have the power, as opposed to the few who were able to build those technologies and capabilities, whether it was the search engines or large industrial complexes or companies, right? It's an individual. I can go mint an NFT right now, publish it on chain, have it tied to a course or a community, issue regular rewards, allow those people to stay with it if they want or sell it to someone else, have proof of attending an event. So affiliation, the desire to connect, the ability that this technology brings for any individual to find their people, you know, to have a voice and find their people. I mean, I am pretty deep in the Web3 space, at least as corporate types are concerned. And I do subscribe to the theory that the future of cities are being formed right now in these mini communities, DAOs and NFTs. If people have gotten into NFTs, if they own a cool cat or an ape or a punk, right? The IRL get togethers are already happening. The building of cafes and bars for membership are already happening. The idea of future of cities. I mean, if anyone's heard what Mark Lore um, is, is building with the idea of designing a city with a particular kind of life in mind that of course requires physical land, but long before that requires a digital community to come together and develop governance and common interests and ways of working. I mean, it, wow, we are living through such a wild revolution to shift power to individuals. And as it relates to brands, that represents not only an opportunity, but what will become a foundational requirement to respect and cultivate community. Otherwise you are literally a commodity. Anything, almost anything can be duplicated if you have the capital and capital is certainly not limited <laughs> at this point. And, and so if anything can be duplicated, then what differentiates? It's brand, what is brand? Culture, a promise of how we're going to do business, what we're gonna do and how we're going to do it. And now that can be, shaped and voted on. People can vote with their wallets, their digital wallets, um, as opposed to just with their feet. Uh, and, and of course, this is revolutionizing work. It's revolutionizing community. But Web 2.0 was more about audience. This is now community. And you've seen these power businesses, power brands, seemingly come out of nowhere because they obsessed over a tiny core customer cohort that became community. And then that has exponential growth around it because then they market and attract many rings out of customers. And you see these 10X, 20X, 50X, 100X growth stories of brands in sectors that are not solely software, which is credit to people who know how to build community. A couple of questions come to mind from that. Do you think brands will be defined by the communities in the future? Meaning like right now, the companies have the power to define what their brand is, but you start giving ownership out to your community and they start building upon that and iterating on it. Are, will brands be more democratized and the, what the, the brand meaning of something over time? I mean, the short answer is yes, but the reality is brands have never been the sole driver of their brands, right? You, you make a thing for a customer, you build community around that or audience. It was audience before. You listen to them. You evolve based on their needs. If you do it well, you grow. If you don't, you die. So the foundational truth of brand being shaped by community and, and well, audience before has always been there. It's just shifting to a more literal truth now because the community or the consumer or the participant 
has so many frictionless options for alternatives. And so if you don't get it right, you know, it, your, your, your death is accelerated, your business death is accelerated. And so um, I just believe this has always been true for the brands that have endured and, and certainly in the recent decades, the brands that have not only endured if they were legacy brands or come out and then real winners um, and taken a ton of share and even created market are the ones that have built brand identity through community and given their community power and voice. Like think about Nike, think about Patagonia, think about Tesla, think about Peloton, right? These are, these are communities that people jokingly call cults. It's because they're communities and not every user or customer is part of a, a deeply engaged community, but there is a powerful enough community fueling the business and the smart brands know how to feed that community. In the case of Peloton, they make their instructors stars, right? They make their stars stars and they reward the community for being on the journey and staying on the journey. I mean, it's one of the more literal business cases of seemingly out of nowhere, community centric, community driven versus audience and marketing. The old CPG, you know, big company playbooks of the 70s and 80s billboards, mass marketing, put it out there. You see it. It's not a crowded enough marketplace for something else to creep into your mind. Therefore, you buy. The more we spend, the more you buy. Then the kind of creeping evolution of growth hacking and performance marketing still, if you see it, but now it's digital, see it. Um, and digital ads and again, performance marketing, I can buy my customer, but you still have to have community and something that's differentiated and endures over time to have low churn and a lowering cost of customer acquisition to have a valuable customer cohort over time. And now it's, you know, especially with recent changes and data laws and Facebook and you, the whole growth hacking, hacking performance marketing approach alone doesn't work. You literally have to have community that has a voice that can help you keep your brand healthy over time. I'm recalling a question from earlier, especially when you brought up NFTs and, and things like cool cats and apes, what are they really selling, right? What does a cool cat afford you when you buy it? You have the NFT, you're part of the community. Yeah. But what, what is that saying about you? Like, and where does that live in the, in the metaverse of sorts? It is, it's actually just so beautiful because it's one, it's, it's a media property. You know, it's an, it's an asset, it's IP. And so, and it's art and art is in the eye of the beholder. But in the case of cool cats, there literally is an artist who has been drawing these types of figures as an illustrator for years and years. So there's truth to the art clan. Um, and, and then there are a group of co-founders partnering with the artist to turn this into community and something that endures as an enterprise. And that could mean gaming, apparel, you know, literally think of Marvel or Disney or Universal and what these characters brought to life by illustrators become in our lives as a franchise. Now add to that the community that is inspired by social media, inspired by uh, IRL activities like Pokemon, right? And gaming. And you're literally bringing together elements of 80s, 90s gaming culture with what we already know and love with media franchises, with in many cases, not widely known, but deeply respected artists and creators. And then with all of that coming together, there's actual functionality, which in the Web3 world is called utility, where you do things with it. And, and it actually, if you're buying it and you're participating, not always because things can go to zero, but often is, has the potential to be liquid, right? And if you need to get out, you could sell it. And if you have a few, you could sell some and keep some, which keeps your membership in the community. And yet even people like cool cats, for an example, you don't have to have a cool cat NFT to be a part of the community in the discord. Sometimes people hear about it and engage and find their opportunity to engage in the community through the community, but they don't have the NFT. So they don't have something that unlocks 
other utility and value add elements. So it is, it is community, it is franchise, it is IP, um, it is utility, and it's just becoming identity for some people, right? The fact that some of these things were in this era of almost celebrating anonymity, and you see people with a Twitter handle that is their crypto punk. And many don't know who that person is. And that's kind of fun, right? You can just like be your crypto punk. And, you know, when I had my cool cat NFT as my image, there are a lot of people in the NFT community who see me tagging and, you know, different cool cats, Twitter things or in the discord. They have no idea who I am. And, and that's really cool. You know, we're all just entering because we're celebrating the art and we love the vibe. And there's this exclamation vibes, you know, I'm part of the cryptodes and creatures and cool cats, and they're all a vibe, man, like they're a vibe and they have very different vibes to them. The creatures NFT being a bit more like quirky and funky because that's the personality of Danny Cole, the artist and cool cats being just adorable and friend, family friendly, which they insist on in their discord, right? And that's attracting a particular type. And the toads, I mean, they're like vibes, vibes, you know, it's just super cool, chill people. You almost like picture reggae music playing. And so there, there are these cultures, these vibes that develop that are one, just so exciting to be a part of as a fan and as a member and as a consumer and, um, and as an advocate, like you can tell you're a part of the revolution of the next version of the internet. Like you can feel it. It's really rad. I think I know the answer to this, but if you were advising like a NFTs. brand, <laughs> well, as I understand it right now, there's more or less two options. A brand could either create like a social coin of sorts to uh, a token, mm -hmm. a token, right? Or go NFTs, right? And create their own content of sorts. Meaning oh, NFTs. so many more options. So many more options. So many okay. more options. So, um, the world of opportunity is unlimited. Like we're all building the plane as we're flying it and no one's an expert because it's changing so quickly. And everyone who's experimenting is stumbling on the next thing that is the future. And that's just important to remember. It is so early, which means it's messy. It's fringe. It, I mean, when you're in it, it doesn't feel fringe, but yeah, you know, practically speaking, there's only a, I think, 2 million people in the world. I don't know what the actual number is, but with a wallet, you know, that where they could even buy an NFT, whatever that number is, it's a teeny fraction of the global population. Uh, and a, a, a still small fraction of the developed world population. And so it's early. Um, my advice to brands, like what brands can do and some counsel is be a fan first, be a student first, buy an NFT which means you have to have a human, like a brand can't buy an NFT, right? I, I mean, a brand can buy it because you can, that can come from your account, but a human needs to engage. And so have someone on your team. Uh, it can be on behalf of the brand or just someone as research, get into a project that seems to be aligned with the brand. Read the Twitter threads on Web3 and DAOs and NFTs and just learn and be a customer, like be a fan. And then, then there, there is a continuum. So that's like the least you should be doing. Buy an NFT, celebrate an artist that you think is cool, uh, engage with the community and do your homework. Um, D-Y-O-R, do your own research used in the NFT uh, Twitter world. Then from there, you could partner with an existing NFT project, right? You could literally like get in the Discord, DM the founders and say, hey, I'm such and such brand. I love what you do. Here are some of our ideas. Do you have any? We'd love to support you beyond being a member of the community. And that's happening. That could be a co-branded drop, like airdrop to people who are already NFT holders. It could be a public facing campaign. Like there's just a bazillion things. It could be a giveaway, just ship it to everybody's houses if they want to put their, their physical address somewhere. So then there's like collab, right? That's asset light, not a lot of risk, but you are tying your brand to a project. Then there's getting into this world that you described, which is what can you then go do as a brand? Going all the way to issuing a token, which is making a promise of some membership and utility. 
my recommendation is if you're not ready to commit to culture and community is don't go what we call red pill web 3.0, go purple pill web 2.5. You can issue a token, but it's not an actual NFT token. It's like an upgraded version of a loyalty and rewards to the point of our earlier conversation, just modernizing what's already done out there, but give it more meaning, more utility, more community, but it's not an actual token like powered by the blockchain. Uh, so that's, be, you know, make your choice, make sure you're prepared to support your choice. But if you're not gonna do a token, you could still create and mint a digital asset, a digital property, an NFT, a non-fungible token. That could be an image or it could be a POAP. It could be like a proof of people being a part of something uh, with your company. And it's a digital proof. And you can sell it or you can give it to your existing customers. You can allow them to mint it and sell it. But then it's like, okay, but why? What does that do other than, okay, cool, I have a Cinnabon NFT. Does it unlock discounts? Does it make me a part of a community that can give feedback? Do I get special early news on things? Uh, you know, what does it do back to community? Uh, this being the community economy and the ownership economy. Does it give me literal ownership? Uh, in some way, in terms of just rewards, again, modernizing loyalty, or does it actually give me ownership like a DAO in an organization where I have a vote stopping short of a security and a shareholder, but it acts a lot, a lot like that in some ways. And so um, that is not tax advice or <laughs> financial advice. So you, you can see how established companies would get pretty cautious when you start getting into this launch a token, launch an NFT world. I really encourage brands to do it and play and explore, but don't do it if you're not going to resource it properly. Um, you, you need someone to facilitate the resulting community from a token or an asset. And if you're going to do that, then make sure you have great devs who under developers who understand Web3 and dedicated resources to facilitate and listen and fuel and love the community. Um, and if you're ready to go there, like there's plenty of us who are here to help, but for many companies going web 2.5 and purple pilling versus 3.0 and red pilling is a better step in that direction. It's like the spirit of web three without the tokenization um, and kind of like the full backend infrastructure of web three, but first be a fan, like just go learn and be a fan. I love this discussion because I consider you to be a master of brand and it speaks also to how you and I have come to this conversation, which is that you have been building the Cat Cole brand. And I've noticed that. I mean, <laughs> first, first, it sounds a little funny, but I think I first noticed you on things like Clubhouse. And I just remember Cat Cole, Cat Cole kept popping up in every room. She's talking, she's here, she's there. You're on Twitter. You've been very active in this role in the space. And I can tell how excited you are about it, which is really cool. What drove you to this? Was it, was it, cause you seem like you could have easily retired, I guess is what I'm kind of going at. It's like, you know, you, you've, you've done I'm a lot of amazing, you no, know, <laughs> right. But, started early. I, but given your career, I guess, yeah. like a lot of people probably would have been like, you know what I'm like, but you seem to just be getting going. You know what I mean? Like I can tell you're like, this is really fueling for you. So what led you to, was it a continuous learning? Just what's driving this interest into this new role that you're entering into as an advisor, investor, and speaker, yeah. and all these other things? I mean, I've been doing a lot of these things in the background for a long time, um, in a moderate way, of course, because my priority was running the company. But I've been angel investing for eight years. I've been leaning into social media from the early days. I've been advising founders and growth stage companies. Again, not many, but a few You know, along the journey. I had to focus on my own business, but I made the time to help others. And so it is like all things that seem sudden, not. Um, it is just under a decade of helping other people build their businesses, experimenting with technology that has built a muscle of loving to learn, um, never being worried about being the noob or the plebe in the room. And, and that means I'm 
it's always going to look like I'm into the latest thing because I'm very comfortable being the least experienced person in the room, even though I am typically the most experienced person in many rooms in, in certain industries and verticals. And it is where people are spending their attention and their time, which typically ends up leading to their money and where the economy goes and where brands go. And I am a student of commerce. I am a student of humanity. Um, I love people and I love to continue to be on a journey. I also have two kids, you know, a two-year-old and a four-year-old, and I don't ever want to be disconnected to what is shaping their future. And when my kids become, you know, older teenagers, these, I, this is the beginning. We're at the beginning, whether it's driverless cars and web three and NFTs and DAOs, like some of the biggest businesses in the world are going to have started as DAOs. Some of the biggest media brands in the world that they are going to grow to love, like we do movie franchises are starting right now as NFT projects. Like I, I see the future and I'm wrong about it. That's what's certain. Um, but I, I like being in it. So I also can put my thumbprint on it. And that, that's the leader in me. That's the brand shaper in me. And so it's both the desire to learn and lead. And you cannot lead from the past. You cannot lead from the past. And so I am a learning leader. And so wherever I can go that allows me to do both optimally is where I go. And that has led me to angel investing quite some time ago, to advising earlier stage founders. So I'm part of a S curve, you know, earlier in the S curve than the businesses I was running at Focus. Um, certainly, it led me to lean into social audio and Clubhouse. Uh, literally, right after it launched, when there was nobody on the platform, and it's what led me to be a part of the NFT community and the Web three and crypto community. And so, I'm still learning, but that because I started learning early, it now also allows me, in a way, to be a leader to some. So I'm still able to be a leader. It's just in something that is still, the clay is very, very wet. Um, and I feel like I can feed my desire to learn while also exercising my muscle to lead. I love it. And I'm a big fan of what you're doing. So please keep it up. I, uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. It's been a blast. I've really enjoyed seeing your passion in person and, uh, <laughs> It's really exciting, making me excited about the future. So with that, uh, before I let you go, I want to make sure I give you an opportunity to hand off to our listeners where they can learn more about you, where they can follow along, anything you want to share. Yeah, the usual suspects. I mean, Twitter for one, that's where I amplify and celebrate a lot of other creators and, and thought leaders. And it's definitely the NFT space. Uh, Instagram is where I share a lot of lessons in my personal life. My newsletter um, called Checking In, which is just Cat Cole on Substack. And uh, certainly I can be found on Clubhouse holding rooms on leadership and uh, thought experiments and big ideas. And you have a book coming out. And I have a book coming out next year. Amazing. Well, let's have you back next year and see where we're at. That'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Cat. I appreciate it. You got it. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 